To understand the law of equipartition of energy, first, we assume that the considered gas is in thermal equilibrium. And, it consists of molecules of negligible size and are hard spheres. We will consider a monoatomic gas and that the molecules of the gas can move randomly in the space in all directions. Let Vx, Vy and Vz be the velocities of a gas molecule on the x-axis, y-axis and z-axis respectively. Then, the translational kinetic energy of a single molecule is Et is equal to half mvx square plus half mvy square plus half mvz square. The number of independent terms in the expression of energy of a molecule is called its degree of freedom. In the expression of translational kinetic energy, there are three terms that can be treated independently. So, the degree of freedom of a molecule, in the case of a monoatomic gas, is 3. Note that, each of the translational degrees of freedom corresponds to the motion of the molecule in a particular direction. If the molecule is moving in space, then it can move in three directions. Hence, the molecule has three degrees of freedom. If the motion of the molecule is confined to a plane, then the molecule can move in two directions. Hence, the molecule has two degrees of freedom. If the motion of the molecule is confined to a line, then the molecule can move in one direction only. Hence, the molecule has one degree of freedom. The degrees of freedom discussed so far are associated only with the translational motion of a molecule. If a molecule has other modes of motion, it will have a greater number of degrees of freedom. Now, if we consider a diatomic gas, such as O2, N2, then the two atoms of the molecules of these gases are assumed to be in the shape of dumbbells. That is the two atoms are connected with some separation. Now apart from translational motion, the diatomic molecule can rotate about its center of mass. Consider that the line joining the two atoms is along the z-axis. Then the axis of rotation will be perpendicular to the z-axis. That is, the axis of rotation will be along the x-axis and y-axis. Because the molecule has two different types of motions, it has rotational kinetic energy in addition to translational kinetic energy. Since the molecule can rotate about two different axes, the rotational kinetic energy, ER, is equal to half Ix omega x square plus half Iy omega y square. The total kinetic energy of a diatomic molecule is the sum of the translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. Or, the total kinetic energy is Et plus Er 
which is equal to half mvx square plus half mvy square plus half mvz square plus half ix omega x square plus half iy omega y square. In this expression, the number of independent terms is 5. So the degree of freedom of a molecule in a diatomic gas is 5 when it has both translational and rotational motion and the molecule does not vibrate. Thus, the equation is true only when we assume that the molecule does not vibrate. But there are some diatomic molecules like carbon monoxide that exhibit vibratory motion along with translational and rotational motion even at moderate temperatures. The two atoms of carbon monoxide molecule are separated by some distance and they vibrate along its length by a small distance of R. Then, the vibration energy of the molecule involves kinetic energy of vibration and potential energy due to the compression or elongation of the two molecules. The energy due to vibration EV is equal to half mu dr by dt square plus half kr square, where mu is the mass of the molecule. K is the force constant and dr by dt is the velocity of the atoms along the length of the molecule. The total energy of the molecules is equal to the sum of translational kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy and energy due to the vibration. That is, E is equal to half mvx square plus half mvy square plus half mvz square plus half ix omega x square plus half i y omega y square plus half mu dr by dt square plus half kr square. In this expression, the number of independent terms is 7. So, the degree of freedom of a molecule of a diatomic gas when the molecule is vibrating is 7. The law of equipartition of energy states that, in thermal equilibrium, the average energy of a molecule in a gas associated with each degree of freedom is equal to half kBT. According to the law of equipartition of energy, the average energy of a molecule of a monoatomic gas is equal to 3 by 2 kBT because the degree of freedom of a molecule in a monoatomic gas is 3. In the case of a diatomic gas, if the molecule does not vibrate, then the average energy of a molecule in a diatomic gas is equal to 5 by 2 kBT because the degree of freedom is 5. In the case of a diatomic gas, if the molecule vibrates, then the average energy of a molecule in a diatomic gas is equal to 7 by 2 multiplied with kBT because the degree of freedom is 7. The total average energy of a gas is called the internal energy of the gas. Consider that the sample contains n moles of gas. We know that each mole of a gas has an Avogadro's number of molecules. Then, the internal energy of n moles of a monoatomic gas, U, 
is equal to n into n a into 3 by 2 k b t. Since n a into k b is equal to r, we get the internal energy of a monoatomic gas u is equal to 3 by 2 n r t. The internal energy of n moles of a diatomic gas if it is not vibrating is u is equal to n into n a into 5 by 2 k b t. Since n a into k b is equal to r we get the internal energy of a diatomic gas if it is not vibrating, U is equal to 5 by 2 nRT. The internal energy of N moles of a diatomic gas, if it is vibrating, is U is equal to N into NA into 7 by 2 kBT. Since NA into kB is equal to R, we get the internal energy of a diatomic gas if it is vibrating as U is equal to 7 by 2 nRT. Finally, in the case of polyatomic gases, the number of independent terms in the energy equation, degree of freedom and internal energy of the gas depend on the arrangement of the molecules. The specific heat capacity of a substance is defined as the amount of heat energy required per unit mass to change its temperature by one unit. That is, S is equal to 1 by M multiplied by dQ by dt, where M is the mass of the substance and dQ is the heat absorbed for a small change dt in the temperature. The amount of heat energy required per one mole of substance to change its temperature by one unit is called molar specific heat capacity. That is, C is equal to 1 by N multiplied by dQ by dt, where N is the number of moles of the substance. According to the first law of thermodynamics, Delta Q is equal to Delta U plus PdV, where Delta Q is the heat energy exchanged. U is the change in internal energy. P is the pressure and dV is the change in volume. The molar specific heat capacity at a constant volume, CV, is equal to 1 divided by N multiplied by dQ by dt. The subscript V on the right side indicates that the heat is absorbed at a constant volume. When the volume is constant, the work done PdV is equal to 0. And the heat energy exchanged is equal to the change in the internal energy. Then the specific heat capacity at a constant volume is equal to 1 by N multiplied by dU by dt. Let this be equation 1. Then the molar specific heat capacity at a constant pressure can be found by using the relationship between Cp and Cv. That is, Cp minus Cv is equal to R. Therefore, Cp is equal to Cv plus R. Let this be equation 2. By using the above relationship, we can find the specific heat capacities of a monoatomic gas.
In the case of a monoatomic gas, a molecule has three degrees of freedom. The average energy of the molecule according to the law of equipartition of energy is 3 by 2 multiplied by kBT. One mole of gas contains Avogadro's number of molecules. Then, the average energy of n moles of monoatomic gas is equal to n into Na into 3 by 2 kBT. This energy is equal to the internal energy of the gas. Since the product of the Avogadro's number, Na and Boltzmann's constant, Kb, is equal to the universal gas constant R, we get U is equal to 3 by 2 nRT. According to equation 1, the molar specific heat capacity of a monoatomic gas at a constant volume Cv is equal to 1 by n multiplied by du by dt of V. By substituting the internal energy of a monoatomic gas in the above equation, we get the specific heat capacity at a constant volume. Cv is equal to 3 by 2R. As per equation 2, we get Cp is equal to Cv plus R. Hence, we get Cp is equal to 3 by 2R plus R, which is equal to 5 by 2R. Gamma is equal to the ratio of the specific heat capacity at a constant pressure Cp to the specific heat capacity at a constant volume Cv. On further substituting, we get gamma is equal to 5 by 2R by 3 by 2R, which is equal to 5 by 3 or 1.67. Thus, for monoatomic gases, the ratio of specific heat capacities is equal to 1.67. Now, let's look at the specific heat capacities of a diatomic gas. In the first case, we will consider that the molecule is not vibrating and that it has only translational and rotational degrees of freedom. Then, the number of degrees of freedom is 5. Then, according to the law of equipartition of energy, the average energy of a molecule is 5 by 2 kBT. Since one mole of gas contains Avogadro's number of molecules, the average energy of n moles of a diatomic gas is equal to n into Na into 5 by 2 kBT. This energy is equal to the internal energy of the gas. Since the product of the Avogadro's number Na and Boltzmann's constant Kb is equal to the universal gas constant R, we get U is equal to 5 by 2 nRT. The molar specific heat capacity of a diatomic gas at a constant volume Cv is equal to 1 by n multiplied by du by dt. By substituting the internal energy of a diatomic gas in the above equation, we get the specific heat capacity at a constant volume Cv is equal to 5 by 2R. From equation 2, we get Cp is equal to Cv plus R. Thus, Cp is equal to 5 by 2R plus R, 
which is equal to 7 by 2R. Gamma is equal to Cp by Cv. On further substituting, we get Gamma is equal to 7 by 2R by 5 by 2R, which is equal to 7 by 5 or 1.4. Hence, the ratio of specific heat capacities for a diatomic gas when the molecule is not vibrating is 1.4. Now, in the second case, we will consider a diatomic molecule that has vibrational motion as well. The number of degrees of freedom in such a case is 7. Then, According to the law of equipartition of energy, the average energy of a molecule is 7 by 2 kBT. One mole of gas contains Avogadro's number of molecules. Then, the average energy of n moles of a diatomic gas is equal to n into Na into 7 by 2 kBT. This energy is equal to the internal energy of the gas. Since the product of the Avogadro's number Na and Boltzmann's constant Kb is equal to the universal gas constant R, we get U is equal to 7 by 2 nRT. The molar specific heat capacity of a diatomic gas at a constant volume, Cv is equal to 1 by N multiplied by du by dt. By substituting the internal energy of a diatomic gas in the above equation, we get the specific heat capacity at a constant volume, Cv is equal to 7 by 2R. From the relationship between Cp, Cv and R, Cp is equal to Cv plus R. We get Cp is equal to 7 by 2R plus R, which is equal to 9 by 2R. Gamma is equal to Cp by Cv. Substituting the values, we get gamma is equal to 9 by 2R by 7 by 2R, which is equal to 9 by 7 or 1.29. Hence, the ratio of specific heat capacities of a diatomic gas when the molecule is vibrating is 1.29. In the case of polyatomic gases, the molecule has three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom since the molecule can move in the space in three dimensions and can rotate about the three axes of rotation. And the molecule has certain number 2F of vibration degrees of freedom for F modes of vibrational motion. We have F degrees of freedom associated with elastic potential energy and F degrees of freedom due to the kinetic energy of vibration which totals 2 F degrees of freedom. One mole of gas contains Avogadro's number of molecules. According to the law of equipartition of energy the average energy of a molecule of a polyatomic gas is equal to 6 plus 2F by 2 into KBT, which is equal to 3 plus F whole into KBT. If we have N moles of gas, the average energy of all the molecules of the gas is equal to the internal energy of the gas. Since the product of the Avogadro's number, Na 
and Boltzmann's constant Kb is equal to the universal gas constant R, we get U is equal to 3 plus F whole multiplied by nRT. The molar specific heat capacity of a polyatomic gas at a constant volume Cv is equal to 1 by N multiplied by du by dt. By substituting the internal energy of a polyatomic gas in the above equation, we get the specific heat capacity at a constant volume. Cv is equal to 3 plus F whole multiplied by R. From the relationship between Cp, Cv and R, Cp is equal to Cv plus R. We get Cp is equal to 3 plus F whole into R plus R, which is equal to 4 plus F whole multiplied by R. Thus, gamma is equal to Cp by Cv or 4 plus F whole into R by 3 plus F whole into R. Hence, the ratio of specific heat capacities of a polyatomic gas is 4 plus F by 3 plus F. At ordinary temperatures, the predicted values of Cp and Cv are in good agreement with the actual values according to the law of equipartition of energy. But at higher temperatures, there are some polyatomic gases such as ethane and methane, for which the predicted values are not the same as the actual values. In such cases, we should include the degrees of freedom in the vibration mode. Now, let's learn about the specific heat capacity of solids. In the case of solids, the molecules don't have translational motion and rotational motion. The molecules simply vibrate in the three dimensions. When a molecule is vibrating, it has two degrees of freedom for each mode. One associated with potential energy and the other associated with kinetic energy. Then, according to the law of equipartition of energy, the average energy of each molecule from each mode is equal to 2 times half kBT. Then, in three dimensions, the total average energy of the vibrating molecule of a solid is equal to 3 kBT. For one mole of a solid, the number of molecules is equal to the Avogadro's number. And the average energy is equal to Na into 3 kBT. Since the product of the Avogadro's number Na and Boltzmann's constant Kb is equal to the universal gas constant R, we get the total average energy of the molecules as 3RT. This average energy of the molecules is equal to the internal energy of the molecules. The change in the volume of solids is negligible and hence the heat energy exchanged is equal to the change in the internal energy. Then the specific heat capacity of the solid can be found by substituting the internal energy in the specific heat capacity formula. C is equal to U by T equal to 3RT by T. Thus, we get the specific heat capacity of the solid as 3R. In the case of solids, 
the predicted values are in agreement with the actual values of the solids. Now, we will discuss the specific heat capacity of water. To calculate the specific heat capacity of water, we will treat water as a solid. A water molecule has three atoms and every atom has an average energy of 3 kBT. The total energy of the water molecule is equal to 9 kBT. The internal energy of one mole of water is equal to Na into 9 kBT which is equal to 9 RT. By substituting the value of internal energy in the specific heat capacity formula, it is equal to 9 R. This value is in agreement with the observed value. That is, 1 mole of water contains 18 grams. And the observed value of the specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram per Kelvin. So, the molar specific heat capacity of water is approximately equal to 75 joules per mole per Kelvin. That is, the predicted value and the observed value are the same. All these predictions of specific heat capacities are based on the classical law of equipartition of energy. Where the specific heat capacities are independent of temperature. But, practically, this is not true. As the absolute temperature tends towards zero, the specific heat capacity of all substances approaches zero. This is because at low temperatures, the degrees of freedom get frozen. This was explained by quantum mechanics because it requires a minimum non-zero energy before the degrees of freedom comes into play. The molecules of a gas move with an average velocity of the order of the velocity of sound. But when a perfume bottle is opened, it takes longer for the diffusion of molecules to faraway places. This is because the molecules undergo frequent collisions with other molecules of the gas and as a result, continuously change their paths. The average distance travelled by a molecule between collisions is called the mean free path. Let us find an expression for the mean free path of a gas molecule. According to kinetic theory, it is assumed that the molecules of a gas are spherical in shape. Let D be the diameter of a molecule and let it move with an average velocity of V bar. When the molecules are in motion, they undergo collision with other molecules which come within a distance d between their centers. Then, the effective region of the collisions is circular in shape. The effective collision area is equal to pi d square. In t seconds, a molecule can travel a distance of v bar t and the effective collision area forms a cylinder. The molecule undergoes collision with all the other molecules whose centers lie within the volume covered by the effective collision area. The volume of the cylinder covered by the effective collision area in t seconds is equal to pi d square v bar t. Let the number of molecules per unit volume be nv. 
Then, the number of collisions in time t seconds is mv pi d square v bar t. Hence, number of collisions in one second is equal to the total number of collisions divided by time, which is equal to mv pi d square v bar. This is called collision frequency. The time interval between successive collisions is equal to 1 by the number of collisions in 1 second, which is equal to 1 by nv pi d square v bar. The average distance travelled by the molecule between two successive collisions is called mean free path. That is, mean free path is equal to the average velocity of the molecule multiplied by the time interval between successive collisions. Thus, mean free path is equal to v bar into 1 by nv pi d square v bar which is equal to 1 by nv pi d square. While deriving this expression, we have not considered the motion of the other molecules. If the motion of the other molecules is considered, then, while calculating the collision rate, the average relative velocity of the molecules need to be taken into account. Now, we will calculate the average relative velocity of molecules. Let us consider two molecules moving with velocities v1 and v2 in different directions. Then, the relative velocity of the two molecules is V relative is equal to V1 minus V2. The magnitude of the average relative velocity, V relative bar, is equal to the square root of V relative bar dot V relative bar. Thus, V relative bar is equal to the square root of V1 minus V2 dot V1 minus V2. Simplifying, we get V relative bar is equal to the square root of V1 dot V1 minus 2 into V1 dot V2 plus V2 dot V2. Since the motion of the molecules is random, the angle between V1 and V2 can vary between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. As such, the average of v1 dot v2 must be equal to zero. If we assume that the average velocities of all the molecules are the same, then v1 is equal to v2 is equal to v bar. By substituting the average velocity as v bar and neglecting the uncorrelated terms with respect to angle, we get the average relative velocity as square root 2 multiplied by average velocity or square root 2 v bar. As a result, the number of collisions has increased by root 2 times the number of collisions when compared with molecules that are stationary. The effective volume swept by the molecules has also increased by root 2 times. The resultant mean free path is L is equal to 1 by square root 2NV pi D square. So, the mean free path depends on the number of molecules per unit volume and the size of the molecules. That is, mean free path is inversely proportional to the number of molecules per unit volume or L is inversely proportional to NV and it is also inversely proportional to the square of the diameter of the molecule or L is inversely proportional to D square. 
The number of molecules per unit volume can be calculated using Avogadro's number and the ideal gas equation. The number of molecules per unit volume, NV, is equal to N times the Avogadro's number, NA, divided by V, where N is the number of moles of the gas. NA is Avogadro's number, and V is the volume of the gas. From the ideal gas equation, the volume of the gas, V, is equal to nRT by P. Then, the number of molecules per unit volume can be written as NV is equal to N into NA by nRT by P, which is equal to PNA by RT. Then the mean free path of the molecules can be written as L is equal to RT by square root 2 pi NAD square P. Hence, we see that the mean free path is directly proportional to the absolute temperature of the gas and is also inversely proportional to the pressure of the gas.